When you're a long-time car enthusiast attending a car meet, it's quite unlikely to come across a make that you've never seen before. That is mostly true for me until I attended a recent car event in Melbourne. One make in particular stood out because I've never seen its shape before and also because it was very orange, so you couldn't miss it. I can say that when I saw this thing, I had no clue what it was. With the canopy up and realizing there wasn't any working doors or windows, it's very obvious that practicality was not part of the design brief. Straight away, you would assume it's a kit car, a once-off example made in someone's garage. And that's a good guess, but the truth is far more interesting. There were actually 683 of these vehicles produced in Australia between 1974 and 1991. Even better, they were produced in a Melbourne suburb called Dandenong, which is nearby to where I live. So that's news to me because I've never heard of this brand nor have I ever seen this car before. So in this video, I'm going to take a deep dive into these weird looking Australian made spaceship cars and understand why they never took off. No pun intended, literally, it's just how those words came out. I was not planning for any funny puns and play on words. Anyway, it would help me heaps if you hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and leave a comment with your thoughts. It would help the channel immensely and I would appreciate it a lot. But anyway, let's get back to the video. I did mention that this vehicle was manufactured in Australia, however, that is not entirely true. The concept and manufacturing of these vehicles first started in the UK from 1971. Due to their popularity, a number of licenses were sold offshore for manufacturing to start outside of the UK. Now I have an assumption on why licensees took interest in these cars to start manufacturing. It's because they looked so similar to some of the supercars that were made in the 70s. Now let's take the Lamborghini Countach for example. Such an expensive luxury car, however now you can probably buy this car for a fraction of the price. I can only imagine that the owners that took licenses probably saw there was money to be made. The first ever model produced in the UK was called the Nova. However, that name did not carry on to the rest of the world that took on these licenses. Once manufacturing started outside of the UK, it seemed as though it was free reign on how to name the vehicle. So naturally, people decided to use cringy animal names such as Italy's Puma, New Zealand's Scorpion, South Africa's Eagle, Zimbabwe's Tarantula. These names literally suck. There's nothing futuristic or sporty about them. So anyway, there's more to that list with stupid names in different countries and there's a total number of 4,000 of these vehicles made worldwide. But I'm mainly interested in the Australian version and they called their version the Purvis Eureka, which is also a shit name. I get the Eureka part because of the gold rush and all, in terms of Purvis, it's the guy's last name who founded the Australian company. So I guess there wasn't any other names that they could have come up with. So we've established that the name is trash, but the idea seems solid and obviously was quite popular to a degree around the world by some enthusiasts. But why? It's because it's a kit car that looks expensive, but uses parts from other cheap mass produced vehicles to make it affordable. It borrows the chassis and engine from a Volkswagen Beetle of all things, so this isn't going to break any land speed records. But clearly, people did not buy them for speed. They wanted these for the sporty design and to look cool for a fraction of the price. Like I mentioned earlier, these cars are not practical at all. The use of a window and the ability to walk out of your car via the door doesn't really exist within this design. It is very much a hop in and hop out scenario and you look like a dickhead when you need to open the canopy to say order something from a drive through or speak to someone outside your car from in your car. And it's also worth noting that the canopy glass is extremely heavy so it's going to take a lot of talk to open and close this thing. Especially in earlier models when the canopy was manually operated on gas struts so I can't imagine this being too fun. But later on electric assistance was introduced. So you're probably wondering, how much does this thing actually cost? Well, you could buy a complete Volkswagen Beetle version for about 5,200 back in 1974, which is about 47,000 in today's money. Now they made a huge 47 horsepower from that 1.6 liter Beetle engine. Or you could buy a kit for $4,000, which is about 36K in today's money. You could source the Volkswagen yourself and they provide you a long instruction manual on how to make it happen. However, just to make comparisons, at the time, 
time, you could buy a V8 HQ Monaro GTS with a 350 Chevy engine, making about 185 horsepower for only $600 more, which is about 5K in today's money more to buy the HQ Monaro over the Purvis. So what was the appeal? Well, if you're a huge fan of Donut Media and you've watched a number of their up to speed series, they talk a lot about the gas crisis. With oil prices going up, also impacting Australia, people were more than happy to have these slow, boring 47 horsepower spaceships because they were great on fuel and they looked cool. Only later in its production, the Australians made these things go faster by introducing four cylinders from Ford, Toyota, Subaru, and rotaries from Mazda. Just if they had VTEC Honda engines around this time, these things would absolutely fly. Once again, no pun intended. Now, it wasn't all rosy with these kit cars because they also came with their own design flaws. One of the major problems with the Eureka was the effect on handling caused by having most of the weight behind the rear axle, making the suspension at both ends somewhat compromised. It was also noted that they suffered from driveline flaws, which only worsened the brand overall. Selling only 683 models over 17 years was clearly not enough to keep them afloat. And to top it off, in their last decade of operation, Luck was definitely not on their side because there was an electrical fault in their spray booth at their factory which caused fire, destroying 99% of the Eureka molds, which is unfortunate for them. This rendered the factory useless for a number of months and the owner did try and pump more money into it to get things sorted. The company did have to relocate to another factory to continue operation. However, the damage was already done, there was a lot of money spent, and yes, they were back on their feet and fully operational within three years, but it is speculated that this caused its demise sooner than later. Like the DeLorean before it, the brand came to an end in 1991, and was unable to continue production due to lack of demand. But it's not all that bad, because to my surprise, this brand actually lives on through Facebook. There is a number of people who still seem to love these vehicles, almost like a cult following, and they seem to be building them up, restoring them, and doing all sorts. So if you really like this car now that I've spoken about it, I'm pretty sure you can probably go and buy one. Anyway, that is the end of the video. And once again, please support the channel if you haven't done so already. This topic was extremely interesting. It led me down a deep rabbit hole of kit cars that were manufactured in Australia. So I can confirm there are more than just the Eureka that have come out of Australia back in the 60s to 90s. So I'll definitely cover more in the future. So anyway, thank you for watching again and have an awesome day.